Good morning and welcome to the 2017 Royal Terrell Museum Speaker Series. We have an exciting and diverse group of speakers lined up for this year. To kick off the new year, the Royal Terrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to pre present our very own Dr. David Eberth. Dave is a senior research scientist here at the Royal Terrell Museum where he's worked for the past 32 years. Dave obtained his master's degree in paleontology at the University of California, Berkeley and his PhD in Geology at the University of Toronto. Fresh out of his PhD, Dave joined the ranks of the scientists at the Royal Terrell Museum and is one of the three remaining original curators who were present for the opening of the museum. During his 38-year career, he has conducted research all over the world, published and presented over 100 scientific papers, convened and organized numerous symposia, co-edited and written books and chapters on bone beds, dinosaurs, and Alberta geology, and contributed to countless museum exhibits and public programs. He is now focusing on completing numerous projects before retirement, and afterwards plans to continue writing on issues related to science, society, and culture. Today, Dave will be showcasing some of the geological discoveries and advances made by the Royal Trail Museum in 2016. So without further delay, I present to you Dr. David Eberth. So um, 2016 was a, uh, also I just want to apologize in advance about my voice. I, apparently it's time to retire when you start losing your voice for no good reason. So uh, here we go. Um, 2016 was a, was a pretty cool year uh, geologically for the museum and for me. And uh, we were able to focus on some research projects, some uh, activities that lent themselves very well to uh, new exhibits and uh, also to a variety of outreach um, forums. So I thought it would be kind of cool just to put a little talk together to highlight a, a few of these items that the, uh, the geological research focused on at the museum. So that's what we're going to do today. So let's just dive right in and we'll start with some fish and some mud. And this part of the talk focuses in on this great block that we now have in our fossils in focus area in the museum. And it's um, a group of gar uh, belonging to the genus Attractosteus, 24 individuals, and it's essentially a fish bone bed. And this is pretty cool stuff. But you have to ask the question, really, why is it cool? Why is it so cool? Given that the fossil record is loaded with fish bone beds, here's an example from the Green River Formation. Um, we know about a lot of fossilized gar. We have many, many examples of fossilized gar fish. And we actually have other occurrences of gar fish. Here's two separate individuals forming their own little mini bone bed. And we also know from the modern, because gar are with us today, they live today, we also know of many death assemblages that are potential bone beds. So if we have all of this information already, why would this new deposit, this new block with gars, uh, it, you know, be so exciting? Why would it uh, attract our attention? And the reason for this is that it, exhibits three-dimensional preservation, exquisite preservation, and many of the specimens, if not every single one of them, exhibit vertical relief through the bone bed. So here's this part of the block shown in a photograph that's taken uh, along the edge. And here's a garfish, the skull, upside down, and the rest of the body extending up through 15 centimeters of vertical relief. And if you think about it, it's quite unusual to see this kind of preservation. Here's another photograph of that block showing a, a broader cross-section. And each one of these little black objects to your eye is one of these garfish that's oriented vertically or semi-vertically or in curve through vertical relief in the block. That in itself is extremely unusual. If you look at the fossil record of fossil bone beds, almost every single example that we have uh, shows the fish are 
concentrated on a planar surface, which might represent an ancient shoreline, lake bottom, or river bottom, so on and so forth. And it's also what we typically see in the modern. Here's again this photograph that I showed you before. This is from Texas, and it's after a drought event uh, where a group of gar have been concentrated and died out on the floodplain. And again, you see them as essentially exhibiting a horizontal preservational style. So it's that vertical relief that really makes the block unusual. And of course, it doesn't hurt that the block itself exhibits, uh, the block itself and the fish exhibit exquisite preservation. The, photo, the uh, projection system here doesn't really do this justice, but here's a skull of one of the gars. It's foreshortened a little bit just because of the angle of the, the fish, dip, the skull is dipping down. So it looks a little shorter than it actually is. But here are the pectoral fins. You can actually see the fin rays, soft tissue between the fin rays, individual scales, uh, this, the hyoid apparatus, which is used for feeding, uh, the dentary and the cheek region, just perfectly preserved individuals. So between the, between the 3D preservation with the relief and the high quality preservation, we really have to ask the question, what happened here? And that's really what was driving our interest in this. So let's do a little bit of background on this. Uh, the specimen was found uh, in southeastern Okotoks, and it was actually discovered in 2011 by, in an aggregate company, um, where they were processing uh, road gravel and that kind of thing. And it was found by the operator owner. And he apparently moved it off to the side out of the way and was having a, a bit of a dialogue in his own head as to whether or not he should keep that or, or contact us. That dialogue apparently went on for some time because the specimen was found again uh, because it was close to a road. And a member of the public, just for reasons that I won't get into here, happened to stop at that point after visiting a Tim Hortons and uh, found the block, saw the fish in it or what looked like something interesting. His name is Ron James and he contacted the museum in 2013. <clears throat> the museum sent Darren Tankey and uh, Jay Guidos down to have a look at it and sure enough the specimen was collected a week later. Um, this is the Sheep River in running through Okotoks and the specimen was located somewhere in here in the aggregate diggings and then moved out closer to the highway. So here's the fellow, Ron James, who contacted the museum. Proud fossil discoverer who gets the credit, even though the other fellow actually found the specimen. Ron gets the credit because he actually contacted us. And that's how the records will, will record his, his uh, contribution. The block weighed in at about 6,000 kilograms, or just over a ton. And uh, here's the specimen being lifted by crane to be hauled back to the Tyrrell Museum. Of course, starting in 2013, it was, uh, it was Donna McLeod who actually spent about three years of her time, her precious time, working on this. And I think she named every single fish in the block, gave them names. And anyway, she put uh, one heck of a lot of effort into this and did a beautiful job uh, providing us with a view of what's really going on here. So if we're going to ask questions about how this block came to be, we have to step back a little bit and let's put it in context. The block actually was found in what's called, or is derived from, what's called the Porcupine Hills Formation. And it's just important to realize that while some of you may be familiar with the Pascapu Formation, a tertiary uh, deposit of sands and muds in uh, central Alberta. This unit extends continuously down into the south, but because of some slight differences in the lithologies in the geological properties of the unit, we give it a, a different name. So it's known as the Porcupine Hills Formation. And that unit, the Pascapu and the Porcupine Hills Formation, uh, are about 63 million years old, 62 and a half to 63 million years old. And just to put this in context again, this block was formed and deposited in its original environment about three million years after the extinction of dinosaurs. 
So we know that the sandstones <coughs> in the block uh, are very, very similar to what we see in the Pascapu, and that these are typical channel sandstones, typical sandstones that would have been in the rivers that flowed through the area. And also we know that uh, this material has been used extensively historically as a building stone throughout southern Alberta and particularly in Calgary. Here's an example of the Lougheed House. So it may be in the future that uh, you know, there are some fossil gar in some of those blocks as well. One never knows. Work that's been done, geological work that's been done by others uh, and a little bit of unpublished work by myself indicate that these sandstones in the Pascapu and Porcupine Hills reflect deposition in what we call low sinuosity or straight channels, not meandering channels, and that these straight channels were deposited uh, in an environment that was seasonally dry. Modern analogs for this kind of environment typically are, are found down in many of the river drainages in uh, central and southern Texas. This is a photograph from the Brazos River in Texas that would reflect, I think, fairly accurately what the Pascapu River systems would have looked like 63 million years ago. So let's see what the sediments in the block say. What can they tell us about how these fish got there and how they formed? Well, one of the things that sedimentary structures, the, the features that we can actually see, the depositional features in the rock, they can help us indicate which way is up. And if you think about it, this block arrives at the museum. It's been collected from an aggregate quarry, which means it's been reworked by fluvial and possibly glacial activity. We really didn't know which way was up with the block. We didn't know how it was originally oriented in the depositional environment, in the actual bedrock, prior to being reworked. And it turns out that by simply examining ripple marks, planar lamination, cross bedding, and load marks, we were able to confirm that indeed, the way that the specimen was found, the way that it arrived at the museum, was correct, correctly oriented with the top where the fish are, representing the upper surface in the channel. So that was good. We didn't have to flip it upside down and have Donna start preparing all the way down through the other way. We can also look at some of those sedimentary structures in the block and indicate to, and use them to help us understand which way the river was flowing, which way the currents were flowing in that river relative to the block itself. And this was done uh, simply by taking a series of photographs around the edge of the block, looking right at the edge, horizontally at the edge, and then mapping onto those photographs the distribution of the sedimentary structures. So when I did that, I was able to show some areas where the strata are cross-cutting one another. Strata from above are cutting down through strata from below, and you get what are called cross beds. Here, you can see one wedging out in here, another cross bed here, another cross bed here. So these help us understand which way the structures, the sand in the river channel is actually moving and migrating. And when we do that, when we put that information all together, it's clear that regardless of how the block was oriented in the bedrock, that the water was flowing from the upper left to the lower right in the photograph. That's cool. It also tells us there was some flowing water there. It wasn't raging water. It was very, very gentle create those kinds of structures. Some other structures that were really interesting is that if you go around the edge of the block we find these areas where there's just no structure at all. Massive sediments. And these areas are indicated by the question marks on the photograph. There's just no structure. They look at it, it's blank. You can see this in the block in the exhibit. But these areas where the sediments are massive or structureless are concentrated around places where the fish occur. That's kind of cool. Here's an example of those mapped areas. Structures end here, and then we just get these massive areas of sediment. Here's one of the fish occurs, and we get these areas of structureless sandstone. Again, over here, up here, a little area that looks like it's been punched out through the center. So, we can tell that, 
I'm going to back up here. These massive sediments also, when we look at other deposits that have fossils in them elsewhere around the world, massive sediments usually indicate lots of bioturbation, lots of organic activity, animals trampling the sediment, fish churning the sediment, plants growing through sediment, and destroying the original sedimentary structures. So that's a, a pretty good indication that we have some activity on the part of those fish. Uh, we've got 24 fish in the block. They all have, as I've showed you before, this same style of preservation, this articulated but belly up pose. And that is very simply interpreted as those animals dying together and being buried relatively quickly after they died. Uh, fish and many other vertebrates, if they're left exposed even for days, will start disarticulating. The carcasses will start coming apart. So we've got a good indication just from the fish alone that these things died together and were buried soon after. When we look at the orientations of the fish, we can map them onto just a, uh, a grid system. And it tells us that there's a, apparently a preferred orientation. If the fish were randomly distributed in plan view, with their long axis going every which way, we would expect this not to show a preferred uh, upper left to lower right trend the way it does. And indeed, when we compare the orientation of the fish with our independently inferred current direction, there's a pretty close alignment between the two, uh, too suspicious to ignore. So we know that there's some flow, some very gentle flow that was capable of aligning these fish after they died. We've got churning fish. We've got fish in a river channel with gentle flow before they died a little bit of gentle flow after they died, and there has to be some kind of flow to deposit the sediment on top of them to preserve them. Getting a better, better picture of this all the time as we go along. Um, just a, another note, I also looked at how the fish are oriented relative to uh, the surface of the block. Now the block itself is, a, is, a, is, out of con is out of geological context. It's heavily cemented with iron carbonate, and you can think of it as a concretion, if you will. And so when we put it on the ground, just because we can put the block on the ground, it doesn't mean that the upper surface is actually reflecting the natural surface, the orientation or dip of the natural surface that was originally there when the fish died. And in fact, the f when you look at the majority of the fish, they fall in line. The tops of those fish fall in line, but they dip gently in terms of the position of the modern block. They, they dip gently towards the front of the block. This tells us that the block is actually, when you see it in the exhibit, is tilted relative to how it was originally deposited. All of those fish would have been aligned at the same horizon. So when you're looking at the block, keep that in mind, that there's a little bit of distortion in how you're reading that block, simply because the undersurface makes the block tilt toward you. And again, uh, just to reiterate, if we were to take the gars that we have in our own exhibit, the living gars that we have in our own exhibit in the in museum, if we were to kill them and put them back in the tank, and leave them there for a few hours, much to the horror of the public, the fish would actually orient themselves belly up because the gases would accumulate in the gut cavity, holding the animal up, allowing it to float. But because the skulls are so dense and so heavily, heavily armored, they would dip down and hang down. So we know from lots of previously published taphonomic work that the orientation of the fish, belly up, with their heads hanging down through 15 centimeters of relief, that that's a natural floating death pose for these animals. The only way to do that, the only way to get these animals preserved in that way is for them to have been in a slurry, a mixture of water and sediment that had been churned up. It would have to be a, such a mixture that it has kind of a thick quality to it, almost a plastic quality to it. So we refer to that as a slurry, a sediment slurry. And we know that the fish died while, uh, we know that the fish 
were preserved in that slurry and did not settle down to the bottom of a lake bed or a river bed with just water sit, sitting above the surface, the planar surface. So we have a slurry floating death poses. So one last little piece of the puzzle is the garbiology itself. And um, if we look at a little bit of information from any number of sources, this is a little bit of information from the Florida Museum that I, that I distilled down, it makes for some interesting reading. Gars are, uh, as a Holostean fish, they're kind of interesting because they, like most fish, they have a swim bladder. But the swim bladder, which for most fish allows them to hydrostatically control where they are in the water column, it is connected to the pharynx and thus to the mouth by pneumatic tube or pneumatic duct. And this allows those animals, those fish, to actually air breathe. That they can gulp air and it gets into the swim bladder, which is highly vascularized, and can contribute oxygen to the metabolic needs of the fish. This is unusual among fish. Most, in most fish, the air bladder, which is evolutionarily related to the lung system, the air bladder is separated and does nothing more than control the position of the fish in the water column. It cannot be used to breathe. So this enables gar to gulp and uh, breathe air. They can't survive indefinitely doing this, but it allows them to last longer than most fish. So gar are interesting in that they can survive about one to three hours uh, out of water. Their habitat is inhabiting uh, fresh and brackish water areas in large, slow-moving rivers, oxbow lakes, and bayous. And they're very tolerant of uh, muddy water, high salinity, and low oxygen. In other words, these are animals that can take advantage of marginal habitats that other fish may not prefer. They also often get trapped and die in small pools and channels. Uh, on floodplains, after floods, and during drought events. I showed you a photograph from Texas. That's typical for uh, gar habitat after floods and uh, during droughts. So in general, it makes sense that the fish are found together in a bone bed. It makes sense that they're not found with other fish because of their biological and ha habitat preferences, biological functioning and habitat preferences. So when we put all this information together, we get a pretty easy story to read once we have the data, once we have the facts. And it tells us that clearly there was uh, water that was slowly dropping or evaporating in a channel. And we have a group of gars that were trapped in the pool in that channel. Clearly, towards the end of their lives, they were churning the water and the muddy sand together, and they created this thick slurry. That's, that's clearly indicated by the mass of structuralist sediments that we see on the block and the orientation of the fish themselves. We can't tell exactly why the fish died. They may have died from, ex from exposure, from temperature related causes, or lack of oxygen. But after death, it's very clear that the bloated bodies went belly up, as modern gar, dead modern gar will do, and they were held in place by the slurry of very fine sand and mud. What happened next, though, is that there had to be some increase in flow. It didn't have to be much. It didn't have to be a raging river. We're just talking about very, very gentle flow. And just enough of that flow to reorient some of the gar into a preferred direction parallel to that current. And that flow also would have deposited more sediment. There are a few gar that are deeper in the sediments. We've counted four that are a little below that main group of 18 that we see at the top. And these may have died slightly earlier and then just being pushed down by the other gar that were still churning the sediments. We don't really know. In any case, this is unique preservation. There is nothing like it described in the literature. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers, there's nothing like this. So this is going to make a fun little taphonomic paper for us. You can see the block, as I said before, in the fossils in focus exhibit right outside um, in the, just off the new exhibit. All right, on to Mars. So I received this email in 2014. You know, one of the cool things about, about 
uh, my job and the, the job that the other curators have is that in many ways you just never know what's going to fly in through the window and door any given day. What opportunities are going to show up? Be it new specimens that are found by the public, stuff that you find yourself, or being contacted by a colleague who has a really cool project. I particularly like this email. I, I've just taken little bits and pieces out of it. Uh, Sanjeev Gupta, he's a professor of Earth Sciences at Imperial College of London. And um, he's uh, known as part of the scientific team that's working on interpreting the surface of Mars. So I'm writing about DPP, Dinosaur Provincial Park, as a possible field site. And that's interesting. We propose to develop a rover that can be winched down a cliffside and explore ash beds, volcanic ash or bentonite, if you will, to sample and date the rocks on the Martian surface. That's cool. And then he refers to, he's clearly gone through some of my publications. He goes, uh, figure 3 1 in your book chapter on DPP shows a cliff face which appears to have two volcanic ashes in the stratigraphy. Please let me know your initial reaction if this is not too crazy. And then we can discuss further. So I was all over that. I thought this is, this is just too cool to say no to. So think about this. This is 2014. I got a hold of him. And he sent me all this information about what they're doing. And it wasn't until 2016 that we actually got out into the field with this team. Well, here's an example of their little rover. This is actually a robot that would be carried on the main rover. If you're familiar with Curiosity, uh, one of the larger rovers on Mars. So imagine a small bot that's released by the main rover. This thing is literally yay big big as a, a large bread box, and it's referred to as the axle rover. What happens is that once it hits the surface, it separates into two parts. So this part stays above. There's a cable that attaches to this part, and the second part, the axle, what's actually referred to as the axle, is let down over a cliff face where there's some evidence, photographic evidence, for there being some volcanic ash beds. Then, this little door opens when they get to the right position. This little door opens and out pops a tiny little drill and suction sample collector. It's oriented right here. I know you can't see this very well in the photograph, but this is, an, this is the actual door open with the equipment sticking out and preparing to drill into the surface of Mars. So they needed proof of concept and they were looking for places around the world to test this equipment. So let's go to Dinosaur Park. Now they selected Dinosaur Park not because it looks anything like Mars. Here are some outcrop photographs of Dinosaur Provincial Park. This is a photograph of Mars. Any of you who have done any research or visited northern China or the Gobi Desert in Mongolia will actually see immediately that this looks a lot more like the Gobi Desert than it does Dinosaur Provincial Park. But because we have these volcanic ashes, because Dinosaur Park 76 million years ago was occasionally blanketed by volcanic ash, which was then during the geological burial, transformed into what we today call bentonites, and that we use these for dating the park's strata and fossils. Because we have those and we also have that three-dimensional landscape, it's a good place to check this out. Not only do we have a few ashes, we have a lot of ashes. This is just a generalized stratigraphic column and each little star indicates where we have a documented volcanic ash. The red ones indicate uh, horizons that have been dated. And this is just a general blurry photograph that indicates again that we have volcanic ashes all the way through Dinosaur Provincial Park. So in 2016 we waited for the wettest week uh, which was June, July or August as, as I remember it. I don't know about you guys. And we had two scientists from NASA uh, arrive up at the park, Pam Conrad, shown here, 
and Dina Bauer, shown here. And here are both uh, Pam and Dina and myself <coughs> working on uh, examining the different volcanic ash deposits at the park. So samples were taken. Um, they assess the landscape. They are now making their decisions whether to come back this coming year or the year after and actually test the little rover, uh, or the little robot, I should say, and uh, see whether it can do its thing. So this is a project that was profiled um, in one of our blogs by uh, Rowena McGowan here at the museum. And I think we've gotten some nice coverage for that. I think it's just a nice little story. It may pay off and give us a little bit more coverage, but uh, it's not directly related to our research, but it certainly encourages people to think about the Tyrrell Museum and Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta in a global context, if not a um, larger, off-worldly context. All right, good segue, since we've been talking about volcanic ashes and dating, dating the park's sediments. I want to finish off with a little bit of research I've been conducting, oh, going back to, hmm, oh, 1986. So this is uh, research that I've been conducting on dating volcanic ashes, bentonites at Dinosaur Park and elsewhere. And I've given a number of talks on this. I know a number of you in the audience have, have heard me talk about this previously. So I'm going to dispense with a lot of the, the preliminary details and jump right to the reason why radio uh, isotopic dating at the park is so important. Um, it allows us to look at rates of change within the fauna, within the dinosaur fauna. And it allows us to look at rates of environmental change that might be related to those changes in the fauna. We can use the data once we have it calibrated, once we know how old the fossils are precisely. We can compare occurrences of dinosaurs elsewhere in the world, which is very cool. And we can also look at patterns of environmental and um, faunal change in those other areas compared to Dinosaur Park, and thus get a much better comprehensive pattern of what's going on globally with dinosaur evolution. So very quickly, Dinosaur Park does, through its stratigraphy, show some pretty compelling examples of environmental change going from uh, estuary and rivers in the foremost formation in strata that are hidden in the subsurface up into straight braided rivers and then meandering rivers and then back up into the estuarine complexes related to the transition to the bear paw formation. Very, very good examples of environmental change and these environmental changes are controlled by changes in global sea level as well as tectonism, the rise and fall of the mountain belts in their erosion. So associated with that, we also know that Dinosaur Park is swimming in dinosaur skeletons and bone beds. More than 500 articulated or associated specimens are documented. We have more than 400 bone beds, and we know that there are many more than that. Those are just documented. And we literally have examples of hundreds of thousands of isolated elements. It's a very rich place. We also know that the diversity, the kinds of dinosaurs and vertebrates that we find at Dinosaur Park is very large. So at last count, we have 45 different species of dinosaur and more than 130 different species of vertebrates. And this diagram is simply a way of trying to visually imp um, impress upon you the fact that we have quite a variety of different kinds of dinosaurs. And because we have good stratigraphic and geological control, we've been able to put those different kinds of dinosaurs in a stratigraphic framework. So this represents uh, the vertical positions of the dinosaurs in the geological package, and these are the different kinds. And you can see that we have uh, a variety of ranges, and those ranges of different dinosaur types and, and uh, uh, changes in the different dinosaur types that, doc that dominate in a particular stratigraphic interval can be defined creating these zones and then we can compare these zones elsewhere in the world. Up to now though we've had a very difficult time understanding what the age of the, each one of these specimens is precisely. 
So again, just a really quick primer on why we use bentonites at Dinosaur Park. We could take any sediment, any sandstone, and we could zap it and get a radioisotopic age. But because the sandstones typically represent older mountain belts that have eroded and sediment that's carried in, the sediment that would be tested by doing that probably formed literally tens if not hundreds of millions of years earlier than the depositional event. If you're going to test what the age of the fossils and the rocks are, you need to test with sediments or something that you can date that was actually deposited in the stratigraphic horizon at the time that you're interested in. So we use volcanic ashes because they contain these bentonites, because they contain crystals. The crystals themselves were formed during or just before the volcanic eruption. And those crystals have within them isotopes, naturally occurring isotopes, that once the magma or the volcanic ash cooled down and the crystal was sealed in, that those isotopes, those naturally occurring radioactive isotopes, started generating daughter product. And because we know the decay rates for the different kinds of isotopes now, based on a number of laboratory studies going back more than 150 years, and we can measure the parent and the daughter isotopes, it's very easy to calculate an age. But the key is we need to use bentonites. We need to use these airfall volcanic deposits rather than just the other sediments because those other sediments may be very, very old. And what we do, of course, is we take our volcanic ash ages, and if we have a fossil or a fossil bed of interest to us, we must interpolate the age between the known precise ages of the volcanic ashes. So this diagram is simply to impress upon you the fact that just because we have fossils, we can't date those fossils exactly. We have to use the volcanic ashes and then infer the age between the two. So here's an example from Dinosaur Park of five different volcanic ashes, bentonites, that I've used over the last 25 years repeatedly to get ages for the park. And these are the Field Station bentonite, the Jackson Cooley bentonite, the Plateau Tufts, the Lethbridge Coal Zone bentonite, and the Bearpaw bentonite. This measured section right here is measured through the entire section of the park. It's a subset of a much larger unit that extends down into the subsurface below the below ground at the park. But this is what you actually see. This is the measured part of the section that's exposed. And the cool thing is that we have datable volcanic ashes from bottom to top. So that gives us the ability to infer with some very good precision what the ages of any fossils found between those volcanic ashes are. All right, so here's my sob story. For the last 23 years, 24 years, I've worked very, very hard using a variety of potassium argon techniques to get ages from the park. These were the cutting edge in their day back in the 1980s and early 1990s. And we were hopeful that we were going to be able to build a geochronology, not only for the park, but also the Horseshoe Canyon Formation and loca dinosaur localities all over, all over Alberta. The problem was that we were ultimately unable to replicate the ages from Dinosaur Park. In other words, every time that I took a sample, I'd sent it to the lab, they'd give me a very precise response. That sample is 76.2 million years old. I go, great. Well, two years later, I'd take some more samples, and I'd put in the old sample again just to make sure that everything was fitting together. And I'd get a separate age, a different age, than I had provided. This was all because what was happening, unbeknownst to many of us, is that the laboratory methods and equipment that the laboratories were using were evolving quickly. They hadn't stabilized what they were doing. Monitor mineral ages, these are comparative ages that are used in the radioisotopic labs that we would send the samples to. These were being reevaluated and argued over by scientists. Again, we weren't aware of that. Decay constants for the potassium argon system was actually being tweaked. Now, the numbers may not look that different to you, but it was, they were substantial enough going back millions of years that they really changed the ages. And 
human beings being human beings, there was lots of fighting going, butting of heads going on between the different radioisotopic labs. What this all means is that we had the potential to, to build a geochronology here in Alberta. It's just that we were too, we were ahead of the curve. The technology and the methods hadn't stabilized and hadn't caught up. So what ends up happening is over many, many years, it's about 25 years worth of research on one diagram. And the simple point of this diagram is to show you each one of these little dots, squares, circles, or, or hexagons represents a different age. Each horizon represents a stratigraphic inter interval. So, for example, here at the Plateau Tuff, we get ages ranging from 77.4 right up to 75.7, depending on what time I sent these specimens in. This is data that was accumulated over 25 years. It was very troubling, it was very irritating, and we did the best we could with it. Here's just an example to make that point. If we just look at one of these bentonites, the Plateau Tuff, these are all the different ages that, I was, that were reported back to me by the labs. Very precise information that each time over many years that the analyses were rerun, we'd get a different age. When we actually take that metadata, take the metadata and we actually crunch it down, we find that the error was plus or minus 1%. So on rocks that are about 76 million years old, that means we're getting error of plus or minus 700,000 years, which completely defeats any attempt to create precise geochronologies and to compare the age of dinosaur localities around the world. These uh, images that I've shown are just different uh, runs that we did at different times. And these data are, are uh, what's behind this summary. So, um, that's the way things were. So I rolled up my sleeves, sucked it up, and I basically created a geochronology for Dinosaur Park that looked like this. Here are the ages after I crunched all the numbers after all of those years and put all the metadata together. What's interesting about this isn't the ages, it's the range of error. The pink shadow that in envelope that encapsulates these ages indicates the error and it shows how much error there might have, there is with any one of those ages. You can think of that as uncertainty. You can think of that as our uncertainty as to what the age is. So for example, the field station tough, 77.5 to 76.5. One million years of uncertainty. It's very difficult to do anything precise when you're looking at rates of evolution, and faunal change and, and turnover with that kind of data. I'm about ready to start crying. It was so traumatic. All right, <clears throat> that's the setup. I wasn't the only one who was suffering through this. There wasn't a dinosaur paleontologist in North America or around the world who hadn't run into this problem. Dinosaur Park was cutting edge, and the work we were doing there was cutting edge because we had sampled and analyzed more tufts and more bentonites than anybody else in the world from a single locality. What was happening is somebody would go grab a sample from a dinosaur locality, send it into the lab, get an age, and then they'd never look at that locality again. So it wasn't until we came along and started doing repeat analysis, repeat analyses, that we were able to confirm that there was something wrong with the, with the method, methodologies that the geochronology labs were using. There were a handful of us around the world that were encountering this problem, so we got together and we decided to deal with this. We set up a new project. This is chemical abrasion, thermal ionization mass spectrometry of uranium-led geochronology at Dinosaur Park. And we actually teamed all of our efforts and put in for a National Science Foundation grant. National Science Foundation is the big funding organization in the United States. And lo and behold, we never thought we were going to get funded, but because they too, the National Science Foundation, knew that about this problem of not being able to replicate ages over a number of years, they funded this project. The whole point of the project was to use one method, one method of geochronology, and one laboratory 
and do all the analyses at one time. So even if the absolute ages are proven to be wrong 15 years later, the relative ages, the relative spacing of all the samples should remain intact and give us very accurate relationships of our different sites. This is a massive project that involves team members from uh, all over the United States as well as here in Canada. These analyses are using a new method of uranium lead dating. The analyses are all being done at MIT and the results have been nothing short of spectacular. Get to that in a second. And the, the reason that this method is so cool is that it uses zircons which are a very stable form of crystal in the volcanic ashes. We heat the zircon grains to these outrageously hot temperatures, hotter than the sun, and thereby anneal the grain so that there cannot be any more escaping of any material, any uranium or lead from the system. Then there's a chemical abrasion technique that's used. We basically start peeling back the outer layers of the zircon and get to the core of the zircon. The reason for that is that even in these most stable of grains, these zircon grains, we see a little tiny bit of leakage of the uh, lead daughter product. This is a, uh, just an image that I grabbed off the web. It doesn't really matter but it ref uh, where it comes from or what it is, but it reflects the idea that the ages of this zircon that were analyzed using laser ablation, using a little laser beam to actually hit and melt and ablate part of the zircon, indicated by these little ovals, that as you get closer and closer to the core, the zircon shows an older and older age. What this means is that there's less destruction, less damage in the core of the zircon, and much more leakage as you get to the outside. So not only do we anneal, do we seal up the zircon, but then we start peeling away the outside layers until we get down to the core. Once we get down to the core, indicated in this slide uh, as zone one, that's what we zap. That's where we take the data. And it tends to be extremely, extremely precise and accurate. It's currently the most precise and accurate method of dating uh, rock successions around the world. So here are our results laid on top of the older potassium argon results. The cool thing here is that the dots that I'm using in the diagram to show what the ages are, the ages are indicated down here, and the rock section is indicated here, that those dots are bigger than the error bar. The error bars on this analytical is just a hint of blue. You can just barely see it. And in fact, where our potassium argon error was half a percent, the uranium lead error is, in this particular case, ranging at around four hundredths of a percent. It's ten times more accurate. So we end up with the results like this. Uh, let's go back to our plateau tough. 75.602 million years, plus or minus 16,000 years. This is, this is revolutionary in terms of what we've been able to do in the past. And these results are being replicated. I took, because I'm just wired that way, even though we had this great project going on, I took some samples and sent them to another um, chemical ab uh, abrasion, Tim's lab in Toronto. And we got very, very, very close correspondence. The red indicates the results from that other lab. So we know that even between labs, even between labs where there's going to be some error, there's always a little bit of extra error when you use different labs, we're still getting very, very close correspondence. So what can we do with all of this? Well, one of the cool things is we can look at rates of sediment accumulation now. We use the curve that we generate between these ages to tell us how the sediments are being preserved, how quickly they're being preserved at the park. So for example, in these two areas, the, the core of, of Dinosaur Provincial Park, sediments are being accumulated at around 4.8 to 4.4 centimeters per thousand years, on average. 
Sediments get deposited, they get eroded, but the accumulation rate over time is about four and a half to five centimeters per thousand years. The cool thing is that these data allow us now to identify places where that curve gets a little strange. Right down here at the bottom, jumping between the Field Station Tuff and the Jackson Cooley Tuff, we see that our rate jumps from 1.8 centimeters per thousand years to 4.8. This tells us that there's probably some missing time in here, that there's a time, there's such a big time gap in such a small stratigraphic interval that is more reasonable because these are both alluvial, they're both river-based systems that were depositing the, the sediments. To find such a jump in our sediment accumulation rate tells us there's probably some time missing down here. So we project the rate of sediment accumulation down through the old man formation and we predict that we actually should be getting an age, if there's no time missing here, we'd predict that we'd be getting an age of about 76.4 uh, million years, much younger than we were actually getting. If we, think about the, if we think about Dinosaur Park in a different way now, if we create a geochronology, we get rid of the stratigraphic measurements, and we think of this in terms of time, so here's our time frame and it's been calibrated. Each step between the time ranges is exactly the same. We're not interested now in the thickness of the rock layer. This is simply showing us what time is preserved at Dinosaur Park. We can now accurately predict and indicate that there's a time gap at the very top of the old man formation. This is the first time we've been able to actually understand this. This is extremely, extremely important because it's going to explain a lot of patterns that people like Dennis Brayman and myself have been seeing for years that we didn't understand. We didn't understand that there was actual time missing there. So, now we have an accurate way of determining the age of the uh, formational boundaries and we can put, we can infer the ages of ammonite biozones that relate to uh, the strata adjacent to Dinosaur Park and we can actually put age dates on uh, other biostratigraphic data sets like Dennis Brayman's uh, palynomorphs. And <clears throat> more importantly than that, we can also take these dinosaur zones and start putting age ranges on them. Each one of these in the dinosaur park formation ranges about 600,000 years. And that's, that's about right. That's how we, it, our current understanding of dinosaur evolution supports that, supports those ideas, that it takes about uh, anywhere from half a million to a million years for new taxa to appear. But here's our time gap that we've now been able to document at Dinosaur Park, and we're proposing that there's such a difference between our taxa below in the old man formation relative to the taxa, all of the taxa above in the Dinosaur Park, that there's probably a, a faunal zone there that's missing because the time is missing, the sediments were not deposited at the top of the old man. So we've gotten to the, the point now where we're challenging the, uh, st the standard interpretation of our biozones. We've looked at some data that uh, David Evans and Michael Ryan have down in southern Alberta. They have a new dinosaur that looks like it occurs at exactly this position. And the, the data that we've gathered from the panological evidence and the dating evidence is suggesting to us that in southern Alberta, southernmost Alberta, southeastern Alberta, sediments were deposited there at that time, whereas they weren't deposited at Dinosaur Park. So whereas we have a time gap at Dinosaur Park, there is no time gap down at many berries southeastern Alberta. So the unique dinosaurs that we're seeing there, which have been thought of as perhaps being geographically limited, that they didn't range up into Alberta, the better explanation now is that they probably did range up into the Dinosaur Park area of central Alberta. But we just don't have the rocks. We don't, they're not preserved. They're not present for us to actually see them. This is revolutionizing the way we think about uh, our faunas, their paleogeographic importance. It also may have some import to help us understand a mystery surrounding a specimen 
at Dino that has shown up at Dinosaur Park called Spinops. This is a ceratopsian that's, that's peculiar. It's known from a partial skull, and the locality is unknown. Uh, my prediction is that Spinops is probably an individual that is related to this gap, this time gap. The time gap may not be just complete and continuous. It may actually comprise a succession of smaller time gaps, meaning that if there is a little bit of rock preserved from that time gap here and there in Dinosaur Park, we might occasionally see a specimen that is, that is represented by one occurrence and we can never find another example of it. So it might help us understand that. Now I know I got a little bit, uh, a little bit abstruse here, a little bit um, into the weeds, so I thought I'd bring it back to what I said at the beginning. And uh, we are answering some big questions. We're having a lot of fun with it. And uh, thank you very much.